um, get to know um, and acknowledge the amazing people doing all different kinds of things to create an Arizona that reflects their values. Um, our values may differ. Um, some of them we have in common. Um, and the people that you're gonna be hearing from during this series are the people who are enacting their values. They are pursuing justice using a pathway that makes sense to them. Um, and each of our speakers will be discussing and reflecting on what brought them to activism, what kind of activism or social change work that they do. And they'll explain to us why they think the techniques, the tactics, the strategies and the goals that they have matter. And uh, they may persuade some of us to join um, and they may persuade also some of us to get involved in the kind of work that we're doing. So I'm really, really excited to have you all here. Uh, this is the first in four series, uh, four talks this semester. Um, the screen that you can look at right now gives you uh, just a, a quick taste of who and when we will have uh, these presentations. And the Seeking Justice in Arizona series, uh, just to repeat for the recording, um, we developed this uh, several years ago, about 16 years ago to help um, all of us understand that there are um, just an array of people doing very important work, often in ways that are invisible to those of us who are either teaching or learning, um, especially here in the School of Social Transformation at Arizona State University. And we're so, so pleased to have this today being our first in our four uh, speaker series this fall of 2020, um, Seeking Justice in Arizona, um, is taking place today in one of our classes and I'm going to um, hand it off to Professor Chris Holman who is going to welcome us and welcome her students, um, give us some housekeeping uh, information and then we'll move forward from there. Thanks Chris. Thanks Maddie. Hey everybody welcome. Um, again I'd like to welcome Raina Montoya to our class and I'm very appreciative Raina of you taking the time today to, to have this talk for our students. I'm really excited because we don't actually get to discuss immigration to the extent that we would like to in the class and so this is just a wonderful opportunity so thank you so much for that. Um, also to my students I'm excited that you're here both the students in intro to justice studies and my other courses who are popping in to join us so thank you for that. I wanted to let you know a couple of things. Um, there is a little button sort of at the bottom of the screen that will say Q&A if you have a question. Um, go ahead and hit that that button and type your question in there. We're hoping that there's some time for possibly live Q&A at the end as well but if you have a question as you go along please put it in there and then um, Dr. Suhey Vega will help us facilitate those questions with Raina Montoya at the end of the talk. So please do that. Um, and if you have like logistical questions for myself about our class, I will stay on after the, the talk and we can talk about those things later. So thanks again, everybody for being here. I'm, I'm really privileged that we can do this in my course. So thank you for that. And I'm gonna hand it off to you, Dr. Suhey Vega now, who's going to introduce us to Raina and, um, and take us off. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Holman. Um, I want to start by saying that um, I'm truly happy and, and feel honored to introduce uh, Reina today. Uh, I met Reina a couple of years ago when I went to one of her workshops for Aliento, and she made an incredible impression on me then. And I knew she'd be an amazing, amazing person to know um, and to follow as the years came. So let me quickly introduce her. Uh, Reina Montoya is a 2016 Soros Justice Fellow a 2017 Echoing Green Fellow, a Forbes 30 Under 30 Social Entrepreneur, and an Athena 2019 recipient by the Greater Phoenix Chamber of Commerce, Commerce amongst many other awards. Reina was born in Tijuana, Mexico, and migrated to Arizona in 2003, fleeing violence. She is an undocumented, documented social entrepreneur, community organizer, educator, and dancer. She is a 2016 Soros Justice Fellow, which enabled her to start Aliento. She is also a founding member of the first Teach for America um, DACA Advisory Board. Reina holds a bachelor degrees, bachelor degrees in political science and transporter studies and a dance minor from Arizona State University. She also holds an MED in secondary education from Grand Canyon University and an executive education from Harvard Kennedy School of Government. She has engaged in local, statewide, and national platforms to advance justice for immigrant communities. 
In 2013, she was the lead organizer who prevented an immigration bus of undocumented immigrants from deportation in Phoenix, Arizona for the first time in the nation's history. In the same year, with the help of the community, she stopped her father's deportation. Through youth-led arts and healing workshops, leadership development and community organizing, Aliento transforms trauma into hope and action for those most impacted by the harms associated with lacking an immigration status. In less than four years, Aliento has touched the lives of over 25,000 people of which 15,000 people are youth. Under Reina's dedicated leadership, 1,000 undocumented DACA and mixed status youth have stepped into leadership roles. Reina's contributions to the well being of, of the undocumented DACA and mixed status community have earned her recognition by the Muhammad Ali Center as a 2018 humanitarian recipient for spirituality, 2017 MBS Latin. NBC Latino 20, and Fast Company, among others. She is also a new profit and Boulder Fund Award recipient. She hopes to share her talent and skills with the community to co-create healing spaces, political change, and leadership development for our immigrant youth and undocumented and mixed status family. Please help me in welcoming Reina Montoya. Thank you so much. It, it is my honor to be invited by the by the school again and being here. I'm really deeply humble uh, to be sharing a little bit about my experience with you all. I'm going to be sharing my screen. So hopefully the tech doesn't fail us and everything looks great. Uh, once again, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm a proud sound devil, so I'm always uh, really hopeful to be back in this new capacity. For today, I'm going to be sharing a little bit about my story and my journey about co-creating healing spaces and agency with the undocumented DACA and mixed status community. Before every, every time that I share my story, I like to start and be grounded with, with my mom and dad. Um, my mom's name is Rosi and my dad's name is Mario. They are the reason why I'm here standing in front of a computer with you today. They are two beautiful immigrant souls that have taught me a lot about compassion, life and perseverance. So I like to always honor them, honor their journey and really acknowledge all the contributions that they have done for me to be the person that I am today. As Professor Vega was mentioning, I was born in Tijuana, Mexico, which is just which is just south of the San Diego border uh, with California. And later on, when I, was, when I was older, I learned that I was only 15 minutes walking distance uh, from, from the US side when I was born. So I've been loving dogs since 1991. I think that that's a fun fact about me. I right now have two little doggies as well. And uh, I just like to really have a little bit of understanding about where is the place that, that I come from and what were some of the reasons why I migrated to Arizona. At the age of 10, I would face my first ever migration internally within Mexico. I migrated from Tijuana, which is a border town city, to another border town city in Mexico called Nogales, which is just three hours south uh, from the Phoenix metropolitan area. At the age of 10, I was very confused. I didn't know what we were moving. It was just one day that my mom picked me up from school, asked me to, to get my backpack. And that was the last time that I got to see my, my friends, my teachers. And it was a very abrupt and, and sudden migration. So for me at that time as a 10 year old, I didn't really comprehend what was going on. And I started building a lot of resentment because I felt that everything that I knew was taken away from me. Eventually, we settled in Nogales, and I like to say that for three years, I lived in the in-between. What does that mean is that on Fridays, my mom would pick me up from school around 2 p.m., and then we would drive to Chandler, Arizona, where I would reunite with my dad who migrated to Arizona before us, and we would spend the weekend with him, and then at 4 a.m. in the morning on Mondays, we would drive back to Nogales in the Mexican side, and I would be dropped off at school at 7 a.m. to make sure that I could continue my education. So in the midst of confusion and not understanding why we were in this situation, uh, I, 
I really knew that at that moment that my parents really instilled in me that that I need that education was important from like waking up at 4 a.m. in the morning and also being able to keep the family together. Later on in 20 in 2003, I ended up migrating to Mesa, Arizona after my dad was able to purchase a home. And I grew up there. I went to junior high, high school, and ended up learning English pretty fast. And I remember that when I got to high school, like I had these teachers that told me, you need to create a 10-year plan. So I obediently follow their directions. And I was one of those students that had my 10 year plan. I took it very, very serious. I don't know if many of you had that similar experience, but I was like, I'm gonna graduate Mesquite High School. I'm gonna do the best that I can. My teachers told me that if I would, if I would be involved in extracurriculars, if I would have a really good GPA, then I would probably be able to get some scholarships. Then after I graduated high school, I was going to go to ASU, I was going to study political science, and then I was going to go to law school, and eventually I was going to work for the United Nations. So I had a a 17-year-old, I had my whole life figured out, and little did I know that life doesn't work like that. As you probably heard on my bio, I did not graduate from law school, I did not work at the United Nations, but something that for me, that, that... that really shook me at that time was understanding that that I didn't know all the barriers that I was going to hide, that life, besides not being an easy journey, that you can just make a plan and it just works out. The fact that I was undocumented and I didn't have any legal documentation to be here in this country was going to create a lot of barriers, that it didn't matter if I followed all the checklists that my teacher said, get a good GPA, be involved in extracurriculars, and you're going to get the scholarships. Yes, I was lucky enough. I was offered a lot of scholarships, but then when it came down to filling them out, they asked me for a social security number. So at that moment, I started really seeing what it meant to be undocumented, why my parents were always worried about what was the future was going to hold. A lot of things started making sense about why my parents would get really anxious every time a cop or police officers would be driving behind us. So at the age of 17, my world was really shaken. And unfortunately, I had, I had my mom and dad, who are my biggest cheerleaders, that no matter all the challenges and obstacles that they have to face as also undocumented immigrants, they were always in my corner and supported me. And because of their hassle, even though that they didn't graduate from high school, they figured out resources and I was able to to finally get a private scholarship and attend Arizona State University where they didn't ask me for my documentation. So made it to ASU, I was super excited about my journey, so much of my identity as a a young person. Uh, Many things were out of my control from like moving in Mexico to then eventually moving to the United States that I felt school was the only thing that I could control. So when I got to ASU, it was one of the most diverse experience that I had. Uh, Back in Mesquite High School, I don't know if you're familiar in terms of uh, Gilbert area, but it's not uh, not very diverse. I was typically one of the few Latinas in the schools and typically the only Latina within the classrooms. So when I got to ASU, I was really, really excited because I started meeting people who had similar experiences and similar stories like me. So, I decided in 2010 to really take action and started sharing my story a little bit more publicly. For those of you who might not know, but 2010 was a very pivotal year that impacted the stories and and the livelihood of so many immigrants. SB 1070, which is a policy that that is known and recognized as the show me your papers law was enacted. Also during 2010, there was a big mobilization from young people coming out of the shadows for the for uh, for the first time in their life to say I am undocumented and when you're talking about undocumented people in this way you're talking about me so I like to really center myself about one of the reasons what I got involved it was because I started seeing within within my community I was very active in my local parish at that moment and seeing how how people that I really looked up to who I saw as mentors is starting praising Chair of Joe Arpaio or starting saying that uh, what people were doing with immigrants was okay. And there was something in my belly that felt so wrong that 
that we shouldn't be going through that. And at that moment, uh, my little 19 year old self had enough. So in my words, when for the very first time that I came uh, publicly in the newspapers, I shared that, that I've been scared all my life since I realized and acknowledged my situation, but I believe it's, if it's gonna be me, if it's going to take me to speak out for those who are too afraid, I will do it too. And at that moment as a 19 year old, you know, I, I started hearing not only similar stories of my peers, but really seeing the fears in their eyes of not knowing if they were gonna come, come out of the shadows and say that they were undocumented students or undocumented youth and had undocumented parents that they might, that may be victims of rapes and they could be deported to a place that they no longer know. So for me at that moment, it felt this big sense of urgency about we can do something, things don't have to be this way. Later on, I continue my involvement. I ended up learning about the policies and structures that were preventing students like me at that time to go attend higher education. So I started to learn about this person, Rosal Pierce, who was the architect of the Show Me Your Papers law, who also passed something called Proposition 300. And not to get too, uh, too policy driven in this conversation, but Proposition 300 is still the line of our, is still the line of the law in Arizona, which prevents undocumented to students to have access to, to federal and state funded scholarships and it prevents them to acquire in-state tuition even though that they graduated from Arizona high schools. So Russell Pierce, it was the same guy who was a state president at that time who passed these policies that deeply impacted my life and impacted the lives of many other people I cared about. So I decided to get involved. He was also representing the neighborhood where I grew up in Mesa. So I wanted to make sure that that we as undocumented people at that time, this was before DACA, that we were able to utilize our voices and our stories to talk to our neighbors and letting them know this is not the future that we want for ourselves. And luckily, uh, after leading a youth initiative, we were able to, to get him out of office and then now he's no longer in office and we've been able to make little, little but important wins along the way. So as I mentioned to you, 2010 was super pivotal. And at that moment, uh, we thought we were going to win. We, the DREAM Act, if you, those of you who do not know about the DREAM Act, it would have given a pathway to citizenship for young people like me who came to the United States uh, before the age of 16 and met a specific requirements. And at that moment, uh, we were doing so many actions from from texting people, from doing classroom presentations, to going into blogs, because this was, Twitter was not as popular back then. So we were going to blogs and put, and drop some wisdom about like what actually immigration laws and policies were. And that was not necessarily effective, but we were young and we wanted to do something about it. So long story short, it passed in the House of Representatives at the federal level, and we were only five votes short in the Senate. So unfortunately, he got filibustered by Senator McCain. He wanted a comprehensive solution that included a, a bigger population. And that's the reason why he decided to filibuster it. And he spoke for hours on the Senate floor. And then five Democrats didn't vote it, didn't vote it for, for the Dream Act. They voted no. So all of this I were to say is that it really impacted me because I saw my friends who had who had put so much hope in a piece of legislation give up. They gave up. They said, it doesn't matter what we do, things are not going to change. And that really pained me. And that really, really allowed me to reflect about what is the type of person that I want to be. And that heartache, it's, it's part of the process, but that doesn't mean that we give up. So later on, years passed, I still was involved within the community and I finally graduated from Arizona State University. And me being a first generation student, that was definitely one of the biggest accomplishments at that time. And, and I like to share this picture because I don't know if you can take a moment to, to analyze the picture a little bit. And I'm holding this award and I'm looking down. 
And this was the spring of 2012. And the reason why I was looking down is because I felt that once again, I did everything that I could. And the story that kept being repeating in front of me was that you're not good enough. It doesn't matter all the things that you do. It's not good enough. Because at the end of the day, I know that I was going to walk away uh, from, from the stage. And it didn't matter if I had this shiny award that I was still undocumented. So for me, that felt really heavy. It felt that it didn't matter everything that I did, that at the end of the day, this country was never going to recognize me and people like me. And then something that you don't get to see in this picture is that after looking down, I looked up and I saw in the bleachers, my mom and my dad, and they had the biggest smiles in their faces. And for me, I learned a very important lesson at my young age that it wasn't about the recognitions, that it wasn't about the degrees. It was about the, the lessons and the learnings, the friendships that I that acquire in my undergrad experience. And also seeing my mom and dad being so proud, knowing that all their sacrifices, all the work that they have done um, was for something that was cultivated, not only for me, but this was a family victory. And, and that's something that I still hold in my heart. And whenever I feel down or whenever I feel that, that the world injustices feel so, so large, I, I think about that moment and I think about that picture and I think about my mom and my dad's faces of pride and knowing that, that you know, that even though that they didn't uh, have a high school education, if it would have not been for them, for their sacrifices, their hustle, and for them supporting me along the way, I would have never graduated. Unfortunately, a year after I graduated from, from college, my dad got in deportation proceedings. And for nine months, I couldn't see him. I couldn't touch him. I couldn't spend birthdays, Christmas, or important dates with him. I am the oldest of three. I have a little brother who's not so little no more. He just graduated from ASU last year. He's 22 years old. And I have a little sister who now is 13 years old, but she was five when my dad got detained. And at that moment uh, in time, it was under an Obama administration. And during the Obama administration, there was a lot of pain and a lot of fear from communities. I, kept getting calls every single day of, of kids and students and moms telling me, my husband, my dad got detained. What do I do now? And then we would go with like our so-called allies and many people didn't want to speak up. People wanted to be silenced because how can they be calling out President Obama since he's our first black president? And there was, they didn't want to be creating a lot of turmoil and even though that our families were bleeding and our families were being separated and were being deported and it became really real when it hit my home and at that time I felt so lucky for one end because I knew what to do I knew how to do a script like this I knew how to move people into action because of my times in organizing and experience um, being a student a student organizer but then yet I didn't know how to cope with with the reality that many people who said that they were my friends or that they care about immigrants, uh, they were making political calculations and were too worried about keeping their own institutions. They were too worried about keeping peace rather than doing the right thing. So it was one of the most difficult things. I felt really abandoned. I felt that there were a lot of people that I am so grateful that they were to sign a petition, pick up the phone and make a call to, so to ensure that my dad was gonna be released. But there were some other people who never, never really asked me, how are you doing? And that really hurt me. That really hurt me as a person because I felt that I became an organizer. I became like something that was useful for them instead of them thinking, wow, her dad is detained. Like what is happening with her heart? Is she okay? I felt that nobody really asked how I was doing as a person, as a daughter. So at that moment, I couldn't really articulate all of that, but I started becoming really jaded because I saw all these national organizations that were concentrated too much about their uh, the perception and their positionality and their access rather than making change and making sure that people like my dad would remain in our country. 
So long story short, after, after that very difficult experience of being separated from my dad for nine months, luckily he, he was released and we were able to keep him here. He was in deportation proceedings after he was, uh, he was let out under a bond for seven years. And just last year, we were able to win his asylum case. And that was a very bittersweet moment because as my dad got detained and I had to fight for his deport, for his to, to stop his deportation, I really started learning about why we migrated. So I had to read my dad's declarations and started translating them. I had to talk to him on the phone when he was detained for 10 minutes and try to draft a legal strategy. And I learned that the real reason why we migrated is because my dad had been a victim of state violence in Mexico, where he was kidnapped by Mexican police at the both local and federal level. So at that moment, it became really heavy because I knew that if my dad was to be deported, was not only gonna be the, the difficulties and hardships of us being separated, but he could technically be, um, be in a position when he would be, would he be in danger and he would be risking his life. So all of that like really, really impacted my mental health. And I started developing a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress and some days, uh, I would I would be driving to work and I would just be tearing and crying and I just didn't really know what to do. So during that very difficult journey of my life, dance became my escape. I've been dancing since, since I was little and modern contemporary has my heart and, and dance in the dance floor, I felt that I could be myself, that people were not trying to figure out how can they use my story or the story of my life to push a specific political agenda, but it was more about how do I connect with my dad, even though that I can see him, I can touch him. How can how can I be myself and make sense of, of everything that is happening around around my life and around the people I care? So as I said, dance dance was my saving grace, and I have been able to see the power of of really building a foundation where where we foster um, creativity and and use the art as a power to heal and as a power for us to make sense uh, of what is happening to us. So that's a lot of the inspiration that happened. And, and as I was telling you, now that I've told you a little bit more about my journey and, and all these years of like growing up with, with the constant mes message, you're not good enough, all the anxiety and fear of constantly living in fear of not knowing if you're going to get deported, but also seeing those little glimpses of light. And at this moment, I was 23 years old and I was becoming very jaded because I was really mad about these organizations and those people that didn't show any type of care. So I was like, I don't want to be a 23 year old who's jaded at life, who was, wants to give up. And because education was such a powerful tool for me to find my own identity and find about why do people migrate, really understanding the root causes of that, that I decided to go into the classroom. So I took a very different approach. I was like, I don't want to be jaded. This is not working. People are too concerned about keeping their access, keeping their power rather than making change. So I went into the classroom. I taught in South Phoenix uh, High School. Um, I did Spanish, philosophy, English, and dance, a ninth to 12th grade. And I also got my master's and that's my dad. And, and for me at that moment, it was really, how do I become a connector with students? How do we make sure that, that they have a different experience that they don't have a counselor like me that as soon as I disclosed that I didn't have a social security number, she said, uh, you might, might as well not go to college. And I didn't want students to have to face those, those injustices and that lack of support and care. So very quickly, I then became Ms. Montoya, the immigration expert at the school. So every single question related to immigration, either because a parent was detained or because the students didn't know how to navigate the, the college application process because they were undocumented or their parents were undocumented, it became it became very hard. It became very hard again and very difficult because I started thinking about what happens if Ms. Montoya is not here? What happens if I get sick? What is our responsibility to our young people to ensure that they have the tools and the resources for them to thrive, that they don't have to be dependent on one person? So I really started challenging myself about how do we think about more 
more large scale and ensure that every single school, every single student is equipped uh, to be welcomed, to be accepted, to be to be nurtured and to be invested in their leadership. So I I made a very difficult decision because I love the classroom and I love being with my students that I decided to take a leap of faith and, I, and that's when I founded Aliento. So I wanted to share a little bit more about the why and the journey at that moment when I came with this very difficult decision about what is my purpose in life and how can I make sure I'm supporting other students it was really important for me to go back to my North Star, which is my family. Uh, these are these are their faces, mom and dad, Mario and Rosy, that I introduced them to you. And then my brother, Mario, and my little sister, Angie. And for me at that moment, it was, how do we make sure that families like mine, who my sister is a US citizen, both my brother and I are DACA, my dad was in deportation proceedings, my mom is still undocumented. And how can we make sure that schools and systems are equipped to really support students and families that look like mine because at the end of the day I wish that my story was unique or was singular but unfortunately I am not the only one there are 17 million people in the United States that are part of a mixed status family 17 million people that includes dreamers or DACA recipients that, like me that are in this legal limbo that we're not fully undocumented but we don't have uh, but we don't have citizenship or a pathway that includes undocumented people that don't have any documentation, any protections to work, any protections from deportation. Majority of states not access to driver's license. So we're talking about close to 60% of them. And then we're also talking about US citizen children, just like my sister, Angie, who she was born here, but her parents are undocumented. And when we think about this population and we put it in a global context, we're talking about that the 17 million people are almost as the same size as Guatemala or Syria or the Netherlands. So this is something that, as I said, is not unique to my story, but it's impacting whole communities. So our whole mission and our whole vision at Aliento is to really imagine a place where the human potential is nurtured and not defined by immigration status. So how do we do that? We at Aliento, trans we transform trauma into hope and action with the undocumented DACA and mixed status families and allies. Uh, for those of you who might not speak Spanish, Aliento translates into breath. But when you give Aliento to someone, it's like giving words of encouragement. So for us, it's about how do we see that human potential and how are we cultivating uh, our spirits, our hearts, that, that we're thinking about the whole person. So with that, we do arts and healing workshops, we do open mics, so we're able to share about our, our journey, our heartbreaks, our breakthroughs, our accomplishments, and really thinking about all the continuum of the human experience. And we do, we take a multi-generational approach. So I know Ms. Um, Dr. Vega has been part of some of our workshops where we have kids, we have moms, we have dads. Sometimes even they bring their grandparents and it's really beautiful to see those connections that families are making. We also do that through leadership development and ally engagement through our nurture program. So with that, uh, we have a fellowship where we support young people, to invest in their leaderships. We pay them because you got to pay young people. So it's a paid fellowship for 10 months where we bring them together uh, once a month as a cohort and we develop uh, their individual leadership as one-on-one -on -one coaching once a week. And for us, we have this interdependent transformational leadership model where we invest in, in the students and then their whole point is for them to pay it forward and create other leaders and work in community in their schools to making sure that other students have access to the same resources. So part of this work is also having Aliento hubs. So ASU is one of our hubs. We have four hubs right now. We also have more than 10 school partnerships throughout, throughout the state and the valley. And last but not least is our transport program because we, even though that we invest and we do the work, uh, by the directly impacted people and making sure that we're focusing on the undocumented DACA and mixed status community. We know that we cannot do it alone. 
So we train teachers, we train people who want to become allies that understand that at the end of the day, we need to change those policies that are creating the trauma in the first place. So with that, I wanted to share a little bit more about the stories that give me hope and the stories of, of the work that we do. And, and I love that we're having this series and, and having a conversation about how do we go, how do we go beyond beyond putting putting our values? Yes, we want justice, but how does that look like and how do we put it into action? So the one of the first pictures that you see is from an elementary partnership when we're going into the classrooms and we're working with fifth and sixth graders for them to learn about their emotions and they use art as a vehicle for them to express where many students in the past at the beginning of our workshops, they would be saying that they were ashamed of being Mexican because they were being looked upon. And then later on uh, being very proud about like, I love my identity, I speak Spanish, I speak English, and then really being able to find that voice and that resilience and agency within. We have, as I said, uh, students like Denise. Denise uh, was born here, but her sister, who's just a year older, was born in Mexico. Her name is Deja. And, and them, you know, growing up in a family where she's able to see, look, my older sister doesn't have the same opportunities that I have, so what can I do about it? So she joined Aliento and she started creating a whole club at the at the high school where she went and where her sister graduated. So then teachers and students have a safe place to, to talk about what is the undocumented or DACA experience and what is our responsibility to make sure that we're changing the, the policies in place to make sure that, that students can thrive. Students like Angel Palazuelos, who's undocumented, he was too young to qualify for the DACA program. So Angel and Darian are in the same boat and both of them live in, uh, live in mixed status families. Um, Darian and Angel's parents are undocumented. So for them, their story looks a little bit different than someone who has DACA like me or Angelica, who, you know, you, you still have a lot of barriers, but not as much as uh, as like not having a driver's license. Right now, Angel and Darian have to drive and have to go to school because here in Arizona, public transportation is not the best. So how do we make sure that, that they're protected from deportation? Because we know that a simple traffic violation can escalate to a deportation. And then uh, Angelica and Blanca, I think that oftentimes when we think about DACA recipients, we think about people like Angelica, who is a student at MCC, but we don't think about Blanca, who is now uh, a graduate and she's a professional and she's she has two very handsome little boys who were born here in the United States. So we're seeing now that anxiety and stress of having DACA and, and especially during this administration, not knowing if tomorrow is gonna get terminated, today is gonna get terminated and what happens with family. Families. So this is a little bit of the stories that I asked permission for them to share with you so then you can get, get to know um, the power that they have, that they're not, this, nor, they're not letting their immigration status dictate their future and they're, and they're taking it upon themselves to pay it forward for the younger generations. And one of my biggest, proudest moments is seeing students like Maria who were afraid to share about their status, who who had friends who oftentimes would speak about immigration in a very demeaning way, very, very hurtful way. She's speaking up and going into the state capitol and educated elected officials about who she is and who her community is. Seeing students like Yadira, who now is not a student, who's a teacher at her former high school in, in the West Valley of Phoenix, teaching the younger generations about advocacy and making sure that, that our young people have the tools. Because one of my biggest peeves is when people say that our young people are apathetic and they don't want to get involved. And I'm like, yes, they do want to get involved, but nobody's guiding them, nobody's helping them. We're just shutting their ideas out instead of listening to them. So for us at Aliento, it's really important that we listen and that we share our practices for them to, to be advocating for the things that they wanna see differently in their community. 
And this is a picture of, of them this year before the pandemic, of course, where uh, 300 students from, from across 30 different high schools, community colleges and universities went to our state capital and say, look, these are our stories. These are the stories of my peers and they don't have access to institution. What is your solution, Senator? What is your solution, Representative? And many of them, you know, it was the first time going into the Capitol and they were so surprised to see that many elected officials didn't even know that if you are undocumented, you don't have access to in-state tuition. So it was really powerful to see 14 years old or 21 years old educating elected officials and telling them like, no, this is, this is the reality that we're seeing you and we elected you or our parents elected you or our community elected you for you to represent every single person, not only a few. And then as we are thinking about every time that things get tough, because not everything, it's easy justice. It's a long, long journey. It is important that we are tapping into, into our hearts and really understanding uh, the trauma that sometimes um, impacted people carry. And in the words of Diana Morelos, who I remember her feeling so disempowered and never sharing about her immigration status, to then now fast forward, and she wrote a blog about her experience stating how crucial it is for us to understand that, that our parents' trauma from, from early life in Mexico uh, was very different than our livelihood and how, how sometimes our parents are put in this position where they have to focus on survival, that they have no time to heal past traumas. So when we're talking about breaking the cycles of poverty, of injustice, of lacking immigration status, how do we make sure that we take an understanding about how trauma and mental health uh, gets impacted, gets impacted and, and what are the things that we can do in order to change that? being able to see little ones, you know, or programming and seeing how at a very young age, they're building those relationships with their parents and that we're able to provide a support where we can co-create places of healing and understanding where, where at the end of the day for us, um, it, it's so crucial that we are understanding that we everything that we do has to be centered on people. That yes, policy change is important, but if policy change doesn't have the stories of Blanca, the stories of, of Mario, the stories of Darian, then we're missing out. And at the end of the day, when as I said, when things get tough, we think about, about our agency, even though that things might look really rough, especially uh, during 2020, when we're getting hit disproportionately by COVID-19, when we continue to hear atrocities coming out of detention centers, when mothers are being, um, are being targeted and even their fertility is being targeted, that at the end of the day, focusing on the things that we can control and that we do have agency, that we don't need people to save us, but we need people to support us and to be there to make a change and to understand that no one in this world, no one, regardless of your status, your gender or your identity is invisible. Nobody should be invisibilized by our community, by our culture, by our policies. And for me, when things get rough, I close my eyes, I touch my heart, and then I imagine these faces of Diana, Diego, Jael, Abril, who have not only survive, but they're thriving. And I know that our future is bright when I look into their eyes, when I look into their smiles and about that desire that they have, that they're not gonna take a no for an answer, that they're not gonna accept the injustices that we're seeing, but they're gonna do something about it. So with that, I wanna end up before we go into Q and A uh, with what grounds me and what keeps me going every day. It's so important that we are committing for justice and we are committing for justice, that means that we're in it for the long term. And that means investing in our young people, investing in our communities, investing in each other. So as I close out, I like to, to extend my gratitude and leave you with these words of In La Quiche and Ubuntu. In La Quiche is a Mayan poem that is the essence of understanding that tu eres mi otro yo, you are my other me. 
And Ubuntu comes from an African proverb saying that our humanity is linked to each other. And then in order for us to, to recognize our humanity, we have to see the humanity in others. We are going through so much hardship from racial injustice, from immigration injustices, that sometimes it can be very daunting. But at the end of the day, if we are fighting for justice and recreating the same struggles and recreating the same oppressive systems that we're fighting against, then we're losing. So this is an invitation to you all to close your eyes, to touch your heart, and remember that we are all human and we have to recognize that regardless of gender, regardless of immigration status. And hopefully by, through reflection, through love and understanding, we can, we can get it right, a little bit more right for the future generations. We're gonna make mistakes. Things are not gonna be perfect, but if we're constantly reflecting, uh, hopefully uh, we leave a better world for the next generations that are to come. So with that, um, I'm gonna close my, the part of the talk conversation so we can be able to answer some Q&A. Some of you might be saying, that's great, Raina, I'm so glad that you're doing that with Aliento. I'm so glad about your story, but what can I do? So I did wanted to leave you with a couple of things. If you are an ASU student, we have an ASU hub at, at ASU. So it's called Aliento at ASU. You can contact them directly uh, through Instagram. They have an Instagram account. You can follow them on social media. You can sign up for their for their events. Uh, I know that they have events every other Wednesday, so definitely check them out. Also, uh, just remember these three very tangible things. Solutions come from the, impact, from the impacted leadership. So making sure that every time that we're thinking about how do we change things, understand that the people who are closest to the problem are going to be the ones who are going to have the better solutions and making sure that you're not forgetting impacted leadership as, as you're drafting solutions for the community. Share your treasure, share your knowledge. Uh, we do have uh, many toolkits around COVID-19. We have toolkits about DACA. We have toolkits about immigration. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's so many organizations out there who, who do this to ensure that our community has the resources. So maybe you don't have all the knowledge, so make sure that you are being that connector. You can also donate if that's something that you wanna, that you wanna get involved in. More than anything, being partnership, we are one community. So you can follow also us in Aliento. You can send us an email. You can do a tag or you can join one of our clubs. So but there's so many ways that you can get involved. Right now we're doing initiatives around the census, cash assistance, when we've been able to support 400 families directly with $500. We just launched an Aliento Votes campaign where we're going to be mobilizing, educating 25,000 young people because last election only 40 percent of them ended up voting. So if we're not voting, then they're not hearing our voices. So we want to make sure that um, that we are doing that this election cycle. So there's, uh, there's so many things and so many ways that you can get involved either through our arts by being a facilitator to joining one of our campaigns. But with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can move into some Q&A and we can have some dialogue. Thank you so much for listening. I want to say thank you so much. I'm going to un, unmute. Where are we? The joys of technology. There we go. Um, I want to say thank you so much, uh, Reina. The, the presentation is, is very, very meaningful um, and also very pragmatic. So I love how you were able to mix um, both your own personal story, your reflection on the role of emotions in pursuing justice um, and the very uh, concrete things that you are doing in your work. I'm curious just to kick us off and uh, I wanna encourage people to submit questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of their Zoom screen. The folks who are watching on YouTube um, uh, will have to uh, get their questions another time. Um, I, I wanted to know if you could expand a little bit on your Aliento Votes uh, initiative. And I wanted to do that by just adding a few words from one of your predecessors here um, in the School of Social Transformation Seeking Justice in Arizona lecture series. Um, a few years ago, we had one of our own recent graduates um, who you might know, um, Ellie Perez, who's been mm -hmm. um, an activist and a, um, 
gosh, a speaker on, on so many different issues, but one that is close to her heart is immigration and undocumented status and dreamers. And she gave a talk that she entitled, um, My Voice, Your Vote. And she used that title because uh, she is unable to vote. She's not eligible to vote in this country. And so she was encouraging other people to use their vote, those who are eligible, to do so if they shared her values of that everyone belongs in this community and deserves the opportunity um, to be represented and to vote. So I wanted to make that connection um, within the Seeking Justice series um, to some of the things that you are doing and the frame that you're using for your own uh, activism. So would you share a few more words about what that Aliento Votes campaign looks like and, and how people can either get involved in that one in particular um, or what they should be looking out for? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Definitely, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you asked about that. So the Aliento Votes campaign, as I was mentioning, our goal is to mobilize, educate, and engage 25,000 young voters and Latinx voters. As I was mentioning a little bit before, in the 2016 presidential election, only 42% of young people between the ages 18 and 35 ended up voting. So that means that more than half of young people didn't, didn't vote. Also, only 46% of the Latinx community ended up voting. And this is not of all the Latinx or all the young people. This is people who are already registered and eligible to vote. So for us, it's super crucial that we are, that we're educating and engaging this electoral elect electorates because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that our democracy, that they're being heard. And this is one way that they can that they can be heard. We are a nonpartisan campaign. So the way that it looks like and the way that you can get involved, you can go to our website, alientoec.org forward slash aliento votes or through our social media. You can pledge to vote if you're a voter or maybe you are someone like me who's a DACA recipient or who's undocumented and cannot vote. That means that you can still volunteer. We, you can volunteer with us. We're having phone bankings. We're having one phone bank today and we join on Zoom. We have music and we share learnings and stories from the field. So it's really it's really motivating to see a campaign that is that is by young people for young people. So every person that is working on the campaign mirrors the demographics that we want to reach out. And we also have uh, have other folks, you know, who who are allies as well, who are saying like, uh, I'm young too. I'm like. 18 or 25 and I'm white, can I also participate? And we're like, of course, we wanna make sure that we're talking to people and that they understand that, that there's a lot at stake in this election. And if they want things to be differently or the same, that they can be the deciding factor, especially here in Arizona. Like Arizona, it's a battleground state and it's gonna be between 10 to 20,000 votes who are gonna determine not only who the next president is going to be, but also there's very key elections coming up for school boards that, that get to craft plans about how do you reopen schools? And I know people feel very differently about that. So this is a way that people can engage in conversation and dialogue. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me, Reina? Yes, I can hear okay. you. Okay, I'm not sure what happened to Maddie there, but I'll go ahead and follow up while we wait for any Q and A's. Again, I want to encourage the participants that are on Zoom. Um, there's lots of y'all out there, and I'm sure you have questions or comments or, or um, want to talk to, to Reina personally. Um, so please post your questions on the Q and A. But um, I wondered how uh, COVID has impacted. Um, your efforts? What are the difficulties or innovative ways that you've come out of this pandemic? Because I know so much of your work is face-to-face -face and, and those kind of um, workshops as well as kind of just general coming together. And so, yeah, if you can talk to a little bit more about how your, your organization is working through the pandemic. That's a great question. The pandemic has impacted everybody in so many different ways. For us as an organization, as you mentioned, Dr. Vega, we were doing uh, we were doing all our programming in person. We were going into the schools. We were doing arts and healing workshops and then COVID hit. So we were really worried about how we were gonna, how we we're gonna connect with our families. So we started doing what we always do before an event. We started texting them and making calls. Before the pandemic, we typically contact around um, 
around 2,000 um, people one-on-one, -on -one, either by text or by phone calls. And then when the pandemic hit, when the pandemic hit, we started uh, our demand triple. So we started getting a lot of questions about what was going to happen. So we were doing in, in a in two week cycles, 6,000 one-on-one conversations with the same team. So we were like, this is insane. We can continue to do this. We're gonna burn out really fast and we don't know how this is gonna go. So we launched a survey just to make sure that that we were hearing from our community. We had within two weeks, um, more than 500 people had filled out that survey. And we just wanted to learn a little bit more about what were some of the needs that our families were facing. And a lot of them trickled down to three areas. It was, it was financial. A lot of the, the community we work with were left out of the CARES Act and any cash assistance. Number two, it was around educational. Many parents and students didn't know what was happening with schools. They were not receiving the communication because the communication was being given only in English or it was only given in email. So then they had a lot of questions a lot of schools transitioned into e-learning very fast and many students didn't have Wi-Fi. They didn't have laptops. They were only relying on phones. And number third, it was emotional. Unfortunately, we had so many families and closing with us and so many students that they were struggling with their mental health, that they were facing anxiety, stress, depression, and even suicidal ideation. So it was very, very heavy for us. So based on all the conversations and the survey responses, within a span of two weeks, we were able to transition our program 100% digital. We were testing different platforms. We decided to do Zoom because it was actually very mobile friendly. So before even the first event, you would see us on the phone, texting and calling and doing tutorials. This is how you download the app on the phone. This is how you do it. And it was a lot of guiding the community so we can kind of decrease that anxiety around tech accessibility. We also launched our own initiative to support families who were left out of the care sack. So we started our own fund Racer, my core team and myself, we donated $2,020. And we said, let's make a challenge within the next 24 hours. Let's just message our friends and families and let's make sure that we get at least to 5,000 so we can launch a campaign. So within 24 hours, we ended up raising a little bit over $10,000 and we made a public. And our goal was to raise $25,000 to help 50 Arizona families. And we were very successful. We thought that we were gonna probably fundraise that in a month. We raised that within a week. So we had a lot of people who were very generous and then we were able to leverage those resources and, and talk to philanthropic partners and other community partners that we were able to uh, alone as an, as an organization, you know, with a lot of uh, national and local partnerships. Up to today, we have been able to raise over $200,000 just for COVID cash assistance that 100% of the money is going directly to families. So now we're going to be able to support close to 400 families that were left out of the CARES Act program. So we've been doing a lot of different interventions. We were able to bring a family and community liaison to making sure that we were answering questions around COVID-19. A lot of COVID-19 sites ask you for your driver's license in order for you to do the test. So being able to galvanize resources that it wasn't gonna be an impediment for undocumented people to get tested. So we have been doing a lot. It's been a lot of work, but also, we've been very impressed with the generosity of people that have said, hey, I might not have a lot, but I will be pitching in $10 or I'll be pitching in my volunteer time to ensure things are different. And I apologize for my doggy. He heard some noise back there. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I want, is Maddie back on there? Or I can't see her. Uh, Chris, I wondered if you had any questions since I'm trying to, I, I can't see the Q&A. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Hey, I, I'm just so glad that you're there, Chris. And Suhei, I wanted to let you know that I am here. I had a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, and so I know that you all have questions and I'm sure I do too. So just please keep, keep it going and we'll uh, keep the conversation um, moving. Yeah, I guess um, I don't have any like technical questions right now. And, I, and my students who are here, I really encourage you um, to don't be shy. Like we have this time with Raina right now. So ask away. 
Um, and like I was saying a little bit before, Raina, like we have classes in justice studies on immigration and justice. And so we, it's a class, it's a topic we don't cover, like I said, really in depth in my sort of survey course of intro to justice studies. But I'm wondering, um, just from sort of like, and you touched on this a little bit in the beginning, but just from sort of a personal sort of self-care place, um, I have a lot of Latinx students. I have a lot of students from other countries. I just have a lot of students who sort of aren't or outside of sort of what a lot of the mainstream sort of self-care messages are. Um, they're not direct to a lot of my students. And I'm wondering if you can kind of just give some tips. This, you know, we have, my intro class has a lot of sort of true first year students who had kind of a really crummy senior year because of COVID and is coming into this freshman year where lots of people are either at home or they're stuck in their dorms and they're not having that same sort of face-to-face -face social interactions and I know it's really it's really hard for a lot of the students and I'm just wondering if you coming from a place of of having a sort of a quote you know marginalized experience is there a way that you can give some sort of self-care tips for our students so just someone else some mental health tips from your perspective and and the students and the families and the people that you've worked with to just sort of help them along a little bit because it's a hard time and I've, I've I've spent a lot of time talking to a lot of my students about how they're just sort of struggling and I'm just wondering if you can give them some sort of you know some self-care tips around that. Definitely. Thank you so much for that question. I, One of my main motivators of founding Aliento and even the word, you know, in the name, it's about encouraging each other and to being able to support one another because being human is hard. And now when you layer down like being Latinx or being first gen and you have all these different identities that, uh, that you're really impacted, sometimes uh, we don't talk about mental health because you cannot see it. And I think it's, it's really difficult. I actually think that one of our biggest threats in society is isolation. We might be seeing each other on Zoom, but are we actually building meaningful relationships? Are we checking in with each other? Do we feel vulnerable enough to say, hey, I, I'm actually having a crappy day. Like today is not one of those that I feel like excellent, you know? So I personally try to be very honest with myself about how am I feeling and trying to show up like that. So sometimes People are going to look at you a little weird. I'm not going to lie. Like I have had some faces when people ask me like, how are you? And I tell them like, actually, like I've been having a lot of back pain. I've been having that really, I'm like really struggling and people automatically have a different bodily reaction. So definitely that's something that, um, that even though that I'm getting those responses, I think that with time, people are more more open and more authentic and that you're able to form more meaningful relationships. Now I have those friends that I know when I'm having like a, a blue day, I can text them and then we share practices and be like, hey, this has worked for me. This might not work for you, but if you want to try it, if it serves you good, if it doesn't let it out. I, I do... Uh, art has been the way for me to cope and because I'm a I'm a performer so it's dance it's my vehicle I haven't been able in the dance floor because I'm still working from home and I'm in quarantine so I try to go on walks and that really helps my mental health I started doing like a mood tracker in my in my notebook that then I color my moods and then I I journal a lot. Uh, another tip that has really served me, uh, I'm not really a meditation type because I'm very action oriented. So I have this guided meditation app that I use that really helps me with doing some somatics, some breathing exercises and being able to let go. And then uh, something that I have made a commitment that it might not be as accessible for everyone. But I know if you're an ASU student, there is a way for that. I go to therapy. Therapy is my non-negotiable. So I've learned a lot about boundaries in my life. And, and growing up, you know, I used to feel so guilty because there's always someone who needs help. Or even I was very abusive with my own mental health and my physical health. When I was in undergrad, I was double major and a minor. Many people say, oh my gosh, how amazing. But what we don't talk about is like how awful that was for my body. I was taking 21 credits every single semester because I graduated in four, four years. And a lot of my motivation was guilt. If I can be very honest, it was guilt about other students don't have the same opportunities that I have, so I better make the best out of them. It was guilt about like, am I gonna make my parents' sacrifices be worthwhile? They have endured so much. So I'm learning a lot in therapy and, I, and that's my non-negotiable. I don't care if the world is falling apart, like I can't be there for others if I don't, take care of my heart and my soul because at the end of the day 
uh, I, I am my own worst critic and I'm really trying to practice how can I extend the same grace and compassion that I extend to the people I care about to myself. And that's hard. <laughs> that is easier said than done, but definitely uh, I know that I just, you have some like mental health resources that you can go. And if you're maybe not ready for therapy, because I know that that's a very different journey and it's kind of dating, you have to find your, your right therapist. And I'm pretty lucky to have a, a therapist that is like biracial, that she's like half Latina and like I can connect with her. Um, but at the same time, as I said, it's like dating, you have to just find the right match. Um, we also have at Aliento Arts and Healing. Uh, one of our students said, uh, not because we are, um, social distancing that has we have to emotionally distance from each other. So we have an arts and healing workshop virtually on Zoom this Saturday. So go to our page and check it out. And it's open for, for everyone. So make sure that you check it out if you want to learn some tips. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rain. I think that's really helpful and really safe advice, especially right now. Thank you, Elena. Um, I There's two questions on the Q&A that are very similar. So I figured I'd kind of jump in and give you those. Orquidia Real and Craig Ruiz both want to know, uh, first they want to thank you so much for sharing your experiences. They, it's touched their heart um, because they've gone through something similar. Um, and they want to know, right, how, what advice you would give for folks that want to talk about their experience, um, but they don't even know where to start or they might be, it's fine, they find it difficult to talk so they don't know how to overcome it. Um, what about those that are afraid of sharing their legal or social consequences? What are the legal social consequences for being too open? So any advice you can give, that would be great. First of all, thank you for your courage for asking those questions. It takes a lot of courage to, to even say like, how do you even start? I think that there's different components. I wish that I would have had this advice and maybe that's why I'm so passionate about leadership development and working with young people because I felt that, uh, that I was just thrown into the fire and people didn't really walk me through like all these questions that you're asking right now. So first I, I, I wanna take it in kind of like three steps approach. The first one is about how do you feel comfortable with yourself? Know that you are the CEO of your story and you have multiple stories. Nobody knows your story better than yourself. So a lot of it, it's really goes back to boundaries. Maybe, maybe today I felt safe sharing about my dad, but maybe I don't feel safe sharing all the details. So being under, giving the permission to yourself to understand what is the comfort level? I know that we learn through being uncomfortable, but is it a learning because it's uncomfortable or is it a trigger? A trigger is different. A trigger is something that is a traumatic experience that you're relieving and retelling. So if you have having a process that own trauma, like know your boundaries and know if you feel safe. Also, it is a gift for you to share the story. So be careful who you share it with. You don't have to open it to everyone. Um, so that's something that, you are in control. You are the CEO of your life. You are the CEO of your story. So just remember that. The other practical thing that I would say is that uh, be with a community that that has similar similar experiences than you. Like I think that uh, I have heard so many young people that that they never share about their parents being undocumented or themselves being undocumented because that was something that they associated with shame because typically being undocumented equates to being bad because of media and I can go on in a whole conversation about the why, but I think what it's important there is when you start talking to other people that have similar experiences, you know that it's not a Reina problem or you don't know that it's an X person problem, that is something that is more systemic. So being able to find those community spaces, like uh, it's really helpful. And then sometimes it starts by sharing it with, with someone, a friend or someone that you trust, and then it, it builds up your courage to figure out if that's something that you're called to do and that you want to share with with others either through media or through social media or maybe in a class like this um, and the other thing about what are the legal repercussions uh, that's something that I did not get a lot of support on but the legal repercussions I mean once it's out it's out it's not that especially if you do a media interview like if you share your story with Arizona Republic like people will know and I would say that I was definitely worried about the legal repercussions repercussions about being targeted. Uh, but at the same time, I came to a point in my life that is like, I don't want to hide. 
And no matter what happens, people need to know what is happening. And I was willing to face those consequences. I think that that's a very personal choice. There shouldn't be any shame or guilt. If you're not ready, you're not ready. And if you want to be protected and safe, that's that's human and that's okay. So just know that there can be ramifications. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I've been out as first undocumented and now DACA since 2010. And thankfully, like nothing bad has happened, but I have received a lot of both, like really negative, like comments on social media that I try not to avoid. And I've also received support from people that I didn't even think about. Hopefully that helps. Also, join Aliento at ASU. They can help you. They, uh, we have like story workshops and we can help you draft your story. So yeah, join students like you. Thank you so much, Reina. We had a question um, early on from one of the students who asks, um, in terms of volunteering, how are you able to personally communicate or reach out, uh, work with families, particularly those who are unable to connect through the internet, whether because the connection is not reliable or maybe they don't have one at all? That's a great question. So as I was mentioning before, we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one calls and texting with families. So sometimes, you know, the programming might not be, um, they might not be able to have it. We try to make sure all our programming is mobile friendly because what we have learned from working with the, with the Latinx community and the undocumented community, not everybody has, uh, not everybody has, a laptop or internet, but they have a mobile device. And typically their mobile device works really well because they make calls and then they're on WhatsApp with families um, in Mexico or in, in Guatemala. So they typically, their mobiles are pretty good and they're pretty strong in their connection. So we really try to be careful about making sure that uh, any programming that we have is really mobile friendly, even through our website or our resources. We try to ensure that is uh, that is very mobile friendly and users can do it. We Something that we also did um, that I forgot to mention at the beginning of COVID, we started doing Facebook Lives because the majority of the older community, more the parents uh, are on Facebook. So then typically a video on Facebook Live, it's more accessible because they can just put it on their phone and they can ask us questions and it's more interactive since I would say that the Latinx community is very relational. So a lot of text, a lot of calls, mobile friendly, those have been some of our, our best practices. I actually do have one more question, if that's okay. Um, so yeah, can I jump in? Is that cool? So can you participate in, and be a member of Aliente, Aliento if you are not a member of the Latinx community? Is, is there an openness to other folks who aren't Latinx, but maybe just have friends and family who are, or just feel really motivated, or just want to find a way to get connected with folks? Is that is that it? That's How do you feel great, about that? <laughs> yes, that's a great question. So we actually, uh, all our programming to exception of one is open to everyone. So you can come to our open mics, you can you can join our Aliento Votes campaign. We also have a census initiative where we're helping people navigate the census. Uh, so everybody can join. We take an immigrant lens because that's like who we are and that's our mission. But we are firm believers that no one can do anything alone and we need to educate other people about our journey, about our experiences and being able to build bridges. The only program that is specifically for the impacted community is the arts and healing workshops. And the reason why is because we want to make sure that that's the only space that people don't have to explain themselves and they don't have to be in an, in an educator role because sometimes it takes a lot of emotional toll, you know, that um, to be sharing about like, I don't have papers because the system it's like this, this and that. So then instead of people concentrating in their healing, then they become an educator, which we have plenty of opportunities to educate the other community. We just want to be intentional about which space is which. So then also our community is getting the, the emotional support that they need. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That makes perfect sense. I just, I know I have a classroom full of really eager and um, enthusiastic students who really want to make the world a better place. And I just wanted to see if that was an avenue for them too, if they're, if they're feeling inspired and excited about your project. Yeah. 
work. We also have internships. We have an official partnership with ASU that we give internships for credit. So I know that the School of Social Transformation actually was one of our earliest partners with Aliento. And we, uh, we got one of their students was our first intern. And now she is doing consulting work with us. So it's been really beautiful to see her, her journey. She defended her dissertation. And then now she's in the in the workplace and still involved with us in one way or another. So definitely internships are another vehicle for you to get involved. Terrific, thank you so much, Raina. That's a, a great way to end. Suhei, I wasn't sure if you had a final question that you wanted to pose or- Oh, there, I was just gonna cover the last question that was posted, um, but I suppose, um, and this could be related to the last question. What advice might you give students who wanna consider making a change and seeking justice in Arizona? That's a great question. I think that, oh, where do I start? Okay, so my piece of advice would be to know your why. Oftentimes we're very eager and I am guilty of this, so that's why I'm saying it, that you wanna do things, you wanna act, but sometimes we have to really take a moment to pause and ask ourselves, what are our motivators? Are we really believing because we wanna see justice because we don't like how things are or because we feel guilty that we're perpetuating the injustices? That's a very different approach. And also I would say, listen, listen to the community that you wanna support. If you're not from the impacted community, be humble at your approach. There's always a way that you can contribute, but be humble. Maybe, maybe the solutions, maybe instead of you posting solutions, maybe listen a little bit before you jump into suggestions. Maybe they have something to say too. And if you're from the impacted community, like, like pace yourself. I, a lot of my motivators was because I wanted to make sure that my brother didn't have to endure what I endured, that other generations didn't have to go through what I went through. And there was a lot of guilt associated with that. I said like, I can do more, it's not enough, it's not enough. That, that doesn't help anyone and you just hurt yourself. So making sure that you're aware about your pace. And then three, you're human, you're gonna make mistakes. Get a mirror and own it. Just get a mirror and own it and, and be reflective in your practices. I think that at the end of the day, we as humans, we're not gonna get everything right, but if we keep reflecting and if we keep trying, then we're, we're doing the work. Thank you, that's just beautiful. Thank you so much. And I wanna encourage students again. I know Craig Ruiz had a question, but I wanna encourage everyone to, to join, if you're in ASU, to join Aliento at ASU. Um, Reina gave that information um, at the beginning. And, and so if you need to, you can always go back and, and look at that um, in, the, in the YouTube. So please do. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanna say thank you and share our gratitude um, to Reina Montoya, uh, founder and CEO of Aliento and doing so many uh, important things in our community to create a better place for all of us to live in. Um, on behalf of the School of Social Transformation and the faculty um, in particular in justice and social inquiry, I also wanna thank my colleagues, um, Professor Chris Holman and Professor Suhey Vega um, from Gender Women's Studies, uh, Professor Vega and Professor Holman from Justice and Social Inquiry. Um, and I want to, um, if we have a moment, just to share the screen to give you a taste of what's coming up um, next time. Uh, if I'm able to do this in the proper way. I think I can. There we go. Ah, yes, we can do that. I'm gonna close mine. Um, next month, um, we have someone who's doing work also in the ASU area. Uh, Maricela Mares is gonna be joining us on October 8th in the morning, 1030, also screened live here on Zoom and YouTube and also recorded and posted afterwards for anyone who couldn't make it. Um, and uh, Mari will be speaking uh, about uh, her work as a labor organizer. And as you can see from the brief bio there, um, there's a lot of work that she's been involved in, in creating an Arizona that more people wanna live in, including being a community organizer with the Adios Arpaio campaign, which overlaps with some of the work that you were just talking about with us um, this afternoon. So um, with that, I wanna say thank you. Have a great afternoon and please seek justice in your way um, and find other people who share that pathway and go do it. Thank you, have a great day. Bye.